Today, um, we're excited to have Dr. Zain Rizvi. He's a newly graduated dentist um, from King's College London. And uh, I'm excited about this um, discussion today because he's going to be telling us his dental um, journey, um, as well as talking about his book that's been newly released, How to Succeed at Dental School. Um, so he's going to be giving um, insight for aspiring dentists and dental students into how to make the most of um, dental school. And um, I believe there's a backstory to the, to the book as well. Um, so I'm sure we'll get to hear all about that. So thank you, uh, Dr. Zane Rizvi. Um, and um, I'm, I'm excited to get into this. I always like to start with the question, why did you want to become a dentist? Uh, this, is, this is always a fun question because there's kind of the, uh, the answer that everyone gives at interview. And then there's also like, I think, bits of truth to that. But then there's obviously other things in the background that people pro probably wouldn't volunteer at interview. Yeah. Um, for me, there was a lot of things going on. Um, I, I basically actually my journey to dental school was a bit convoluted. I finished school and I actually applied and got into biomedical science okay. um, at Imperial College London. So I'd never actually applied with dental school in mind out of, out of um, my schooling process. The reason I applied for biomed was because I was actually playing um, cricket. I love cricket. It's like my favorite sport. And I was playing that's quite a high standard in school. And I was considering uh, trying to turn professional, basically. And um, those of you who have kind of parents from an ethnic background know that they're not going to just let you do professional sport without any kind of degree behind you. So I think for me, it was more a case of, right, it makes more sense to do a three year degree, have that behind my belt and then push on and see if I can make it. And I'll know by the age of 21 whether or not it's going to happen, because with these things, you kind of need to get into that kind of uh, professional process, you know, within. So, kind of so biomedical science was literally the passport for you to pursue cricket. Pretty much, pretty much. I did have an interest in it. I def at school, I was I was strong in two things at school: English and also sciences. So, I had the route of like kind of going through journalism and law, maybe, um, and then I also had the chance to go through sciences. And again, I was like weighing up the two, and I was like, I think in terms of transferability and in this situation, what I'm looking for is having something that can. I can fall back on it made a little bit more sense in the economy to kind of go for a stem based approach than maybe something a little bit more kind of humanitarian yes. um so i was i was into biomed don't get me wrong it was just that yeah it, it, it was kind of on the back burners at that time and then i think as i went through the process i came to london imperial was great um i threw myself into a lot of the kind of stuff going on mm. um and then i kind of started to to realize that okay this uh, i'm not going to make it professional i'll still keep playing the sport socially um and then i started thinking right what do i want to do and i think with biomed because it's quite similar to medicine in that it's basically the pre-medicine before you go out onto the clinics we kind of shared a lot of our med medic lectures uh, our lectures with medics i started thinking right i really like the concept of applying medicine but i'm i'm a people's person like i really want to have patience yeah and then I kind of, because I was living with medics at the time, I could see kind of the way that they were going about things in their degree. And I was like, I, I do see the appeal, but there's also a number of things that I see as quite problematic and things that perhaps don't appeal to me in terms of how I want to live my life. Mm. And those are the things that I think people shy away from stating. And it's something that I cover in the book, which is that these aren't things to be ashamed of, you know, like wanting a work-life balance, for example, or wanting yeah. financial compensation and reward for, you know, the years of study and the years of work that you put in. Um, not everyone wants those things in the same kind of way as each other. But I think for me, those are two things that were quite important. And I was also like, you know, I do want that patient interaction. Um, I had some exposure to some dentists who used to live near me. Um, mm -hmm. in, I used to live in Leicester. I grew up in Leicestershire. So um, I went to Union in Leicester as well. Really? Union in Leicester, yes. I did medical physiology mm -hmm. there. Uh, fantastic yeah. place. Yeah, 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 yeah. Place where I used to live. Yeah, I grew up in Leicester, loved it. And my neighbours were, were dentists there. And I actually did some work experience with them in school uh, just to kind of try it out and see it. And I did like it. I, I saw the appeal for sure. Um, so I think for me, it was kind of between medicine and dentistry. And, and I, was, I was really 
quite keen on dentistry. I wasn't really considering medicine that much because I had so much exposure to it at Imperial through my friends. Um, even a lot of them were like, just do dentistry. Trust me, it's a smarter decision. Do dentistry. Um, so I applied uh, to King's. I got onto the graduate program as well, which was ideal for me because, you know, with student funding and all that kind of thing, um, it really works out well if you get onto that four-year program. What, what was it like, the process of um, making that decision that you want to pursue dentistry and then preparing um, for the application? Yeah, I think, I think I'm someone who likes to plan quite far in advance. So I think I'd, I'd made that decision, I think, by the start of my second year of Imperial. So quite early on in, in the, the process. And then the actual process itself of applying, I think, um, very similar to what you would do out of school, you know, through UCAS. It's just like, it's all quite independent. Whereas at school, I had people kind of holding my hand through each stage of the application. In this, it was like up to me to, to book my uh, UCAT test, up to me to write my personal statement, find references at uni, etc. Mm. But I think the way that the UCAS online system is now, it's very easy to kind of navigate your way through the application and just submit it. And I kind of submitted it thinking, you know, what's the worst that can happen? They'd say, no, I kind of have still got a degree and, and I can go find a job somewhere else in the city, for example. How, um, how, how did you go about making your application competitive though? Um, okay. So yeah. things like work experience, which can be a struggle for some people yeah. to acquire, um, yeah. putting together the personal statement, um, yeah. which can be a difficult one for people to make it really stand out and competitive. How did you approach those? Yeah, um, that's a good question. So work experience perhaps is the biggest barrier for me and it, was, it has been for I think most students to be honest. Um, for me, I was fortunate. So not only did I have my neighbours who I could kind of fall upon in, in the worst case scenario, but actually I was lucky in that one of my best friends at Imperial, his brother had just finished dental school and was in his foundation year. So I got in touch with him and he, him and his practice were more than happy to come to have me come almost actually it was like a month before my interview. So it was ideal because I got this exposure so close to my interview date that I could just talk about very easily. Mm. Um, and it was a foundation trainee. So it meant that I kind of got close uh, contact with kind of what he was doing he was almost talking through the processes for himself as much as for my own benefit so it was very useful and I would say anyone looking for work experience obviously you can't really be that fussy in this day and age because not many people let you shadow them but if you can try and get a young kind of trainee dentist because they almost teach you as they're going along because it's helpful for them yeah um, it's also more inspiring because they tend to be more enthusiastic than someone maybe who's been doing it for many many years but that's not always the case sometimes you get older dentists who are really passionate too um, so that was my work experience journey, but I would say just kind of with work experience, you just have to have a thick skin and just throw a load of emails out, phone people up. I think a lot of students, cause they're quite shy, they send emails and wait for a response, but actually dentists, as you know, are just super busy people. And I think if you ring up a practice, speak to the practice manager, I think you just need to be a bit assertive and get on the phone. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, people will say no, but you might get that one. Yes. And that's all you need. You need yeah. Um, so that was my work experience, uh, moving on to personal statements. So um, I kind of enjoyed the personal statement side of things because I enjoy writing quite a lot. Um, I've been asked about kind of how to structure a personal statement a lot over the years. And I think the best advice I can give is, I, I remember once speaking to the admissions tutors at King's and they were like, with the personal statement, a lot of people like name dropping, saying that I work in this place or that place or this, or this research center or that center. And they were like, we can't discriminate based on uh, where you've done something because not everyone has equal opportunity. And that's a fact. Like, you know, you might live next door to a dental research center, in which case it's very easy for you to knock on their door and be like, you know, let me do some experience with you. But there's other people who don't have a dentist within like a five mile radius of them. And, and you know, they don't have the resources to arrange that. So what they said was in your personal statement and your application in general, you want to be able to reflect on whatever experience you've had. So it doesn't matter if you've not had you know, as great as an experience as someone else, but you should all be able to reflect and, and what did you learn from it? That's what they want to hear because they can assess based on reflection skills and everyone can reflect no matter who you are. So, did, they, did they ever mention anything about the amount of work experience? Because we all get hooked on this thing of two weeks as the magic weeks. number. Yeah. I have no idea where that, where that figures come from. I mean, I, I can't speak for what admissions tutor want. I know some places might specify on there. You know, the best way is just to ring them up or look on their website. I think ringing them up is probably better because you'll get a response. Um, I also had two weeks and it seems to be the, the kind of the, the figure that everyone can say. I mean, in personally, in my opinion, um, two weeks was more than enough in terms of, you know, within a few days of shadowing, you kind of get a feel for what dentistry involves. And... I wouldn't say that in the second week you're going to learn anything necessarily 
more advanced or more uh, helpful than you would see in the first couple of days of shadowing someone. Yeah. So sometimes I feel like two weeks is a little bit excessive, but I guess two weeks in total in a different in different environments can be quite helpful. Yeah. Um, that's certainly something that would you'd be looking good at in interview if you can kind of talk about different areas that you've had experience in. But like I said, it's quite difficult to find work experience in the first place. So two weeks of it is quite um, quite a lot. You talked about. Um applying to kings um i tend to hear that kings is heavy on the ucat it used to be called the uk cat um yeah. how how was your experience of the uk cat and um if, if you still remember your score what, what was yeah. it so so i remember this because um it was something i was genuinely worried about and i'm not someone who's ever been strong at these kind of like abstract aptitude tests and i think a lot of people also feel the same way until you know they've done it and then they, they either get a good score or they don't I was also worried because I'd heard the same thing, that kings are very heavy on it. Um, they always give the same answer, which is we always judge it relative to the year's uh, cohort. So, you know, if your year has done well, then they'll have a higher cutoff. And if your year has not done very well, then it will be lower. So I was worried about this. And I mean, I, my score, I wouldn't say it was bad, but I wouldn't say it was. For, if you think about the fact that I was a graduate student, so we automatically have to perform a little bit better because we're compared against other grads. So the standard's a little bit higher in the application process. Okay, so you applied for the grad entry as a, as opposed to the undergrad entry. So for people who don't know, grad entry is four years. Oh, applied both. Okay. So my, my, my options were two graduate schemes in King's graduate and Liverpool graduate and then two undergraduate schemes. So I also applied for King's undergraduate, and then I applied for Bart's undergraduate. Um, so yeah, well, I was kind of in, in both situations, in both boats. What I will say is the application process for grad and undergrad in terms of the way the interview is structured and everything is identical. So even the questions I got asked were pretty much the same. Um, so what happened? Yeah, so uh, with UCAT, I got a score of six, seven, five, which, for me at the time, I was like, okay, it's not the worst, but I, it was certainly not what I considered competitive for a uni that really values the UCAT. I was like, oh, yeah. that's probably, for a grad, that I probably undershot a little bit there. It's very interesting but, to find out. Yeah, because um, yeah. you get people saying, you know, you're going to get 700 and above to be really competitive. Yeah. I got yeah. six, fifth, 670 myself. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it's interesting how people on the outside view it and then how it's actually viewed by yeah. the admissions choose. But yeah, yeah so, sorry, carry on. No, no, I mean, to put it into context, it's a difficult one because there are definitely people in my cohort that I spoke to afterwards uh, who got into Kings and they are all very kind of in that 700 plus bracket. But clearly there were a few of us that, you know, weren't and there was something about our application that kind of uh, substituted for that. And that, that is also another thing that admission students generally will say, which is that it's just a factor in your application. It's not the be all and end all. If you've got strong grades from a strong, in my case, a strong uni, um, you know, that, that's, that's, that carries its weight and it's worth its weight in gold. Um, so it's not all just on that UCAT. It's kind of like to level, level out. So let's say you haven't got the best marks at school. Mm. If you get a really strong UCAT score, then they kind of view it as kind of compensatory. And similarly, if you're very academic at school, but you get a low UCAT, then it can kind of balance out as well. Um, so I wouldn't say get too hung up on it. The advantage of the UCAT is that you obviously get the result before you apply. So you can kind of, I guess, look to choose unis that are maybe less UCAT heavy. For me, I chose Liverpool because they, at that point, they never even considered the UCAT as, as an application factor. Mm. So I was like, you know, I've got the best of both worlds in that one's UCAT consider it and one's not. Yeah. I don't know if there's any unis left now that don't look at the UCAT. I feel like- You plan. You clan maybe yeah there are very i think they're kind of you know very few but um i think the best thing to do is maybe ring them up and ask them for like a list of last year's threshold or cutoff then you can get kind of like an idea of where where they might they might lie um so that was my ucat and yeah it's one of those tests where it's, it, people say that you know you can prepare and revise for it and you can definitely familiarize yourself with the format but on the day, the questions could be anything. It's not like there's like a limited bank of questions. They have a massive bank. So yeah. I think timing was the main issue for me and everyone says that. So yeah. that's What was your experience of um, being in the second year of um, your yeah. undergrad degree um, at Imperial and also preparing for dental school applications? So again, I think I planned it out very 
long term, which made it a lot easier for me. I know mm. I think it can be very because you apply if you want to get into dental school literally as soon as you finish one degree and and then start dental school like I did. You want you're going to be submitting your application in the September of your final year. Um, so what you basically need to do is I think you need to start thinking about these things probably towards the end of your second year so that you can kind of get everything like references personal statement book your UCAT all of that done over the summer pretty much yeah. so I kind of knew by I'd say Christmas time of my second year so I, I knew that I was going to do this almost a year in advance of when I actually did it and I probably started to kind of talk to lecturers or, or references that potential references because at uni it's also harder to find a reliable reference because most people just give you a lecture and then you don't really have any contact with them mm. so I had to kind of find supervisors that knew me well enough but I also remember sending them my CV to give them a little bit more to kind of know me because um, they only really knew me academically and not really outside of that whereas teachers know you kind of you know as a, as a person which is yeah. ideal so um I kind of sent them a CV. I also tried to find references that were relevant to medicine applicants or or, because Imperial doesn't have a dental school. So I thought the next best best thing was to find people who write medical applicants references or people who are admissions tutors for medical school because it's kind of like a similar thought process. Um, So got like lining them up around the second year, end of second year, booked my UCAT over that summer. It wasn't too stressful because I did it in the summer. I think if you try and do it during term time, it can get really tricky, especially if you've got assignments and deadlines with, you know, essays and stuff in biomed. So I think because I got most of it done over the summer, there wasn't much left for me to do in September, apart from just kind of submit the thing. Yeah. And um, in terms of starting um, at, actually, no, what offers um, did you end up getting? Um, And then tell us about actually starting dental school. So... Um, this was a really interesting process because I was convinced that my UCAT wasn't good enough for Kings and that for Liverpool, I felt like I had a really great chance because I was like, no UCAT. And also I like to think that like I perform better in an interview like stage than I do kind of over the internet or through an application. So I remember going to both interviews, the Kings interview and the Liverpool interviews. Yeah. And I remember thinking the Kings interview was fine. It was just very general in terms of like you know what do you do outside of sport uh, outside outside of dentistry and kind of what you're into and it's just like a general chat and I was like oh there wasn't really anything dentally specific there apart from a few you know scenarios and so I remember thinking okay that was okay and I was like oh but my UCAT's quite low so they probably won't take me and then I went to Liverpool and it was a it was like a 15 station MMI it was really long and I remember feeling quite good at the end of it. I was like wow that was really fun and like I really enjoyed that and then when the offers came back it was Liverpool that had rejected me Kings had given me an offer for their grad scheme um, as well as their undergrad scheme and then the uh, other one was Bart's and they actually rejected me straight off the bat so they didn't they didn't interview me at all um, which was interesting because a couple of grads that I know applied to Bart's and they also got straight up rejection so I don't know if they had a policy which was like we don't accept grads for our undergrad scheme um, I'm not sure about that one because I know Bart's used to have a grad scheme that they stopped that same year. So I'm not sure how they kind of structured their shortlisting process. Um, and then, yeah, I started Kings and a very, very difficult first year because you start in the second year of the undergraduate scheme yeah. at, at Kings anyway. So we had to almost combine two years worth of dental content into one, which was quite, was quite difficult to be honest. 